As Pastor Heather already said, we will be looking at Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 to 15, a familiar story carrying on in the theme of Moses' life from last week in the lectionary. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Oreb, the mountain of God. And there the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that the bush was on fire and it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. And when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. And then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. I was pretty good, right? And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask you, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. That is what you are to tell the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name you shall call me from generation to generation. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Today we fast forward into the adult life of Moses, from where Pastor Heather left off last week in her message about Moses' birth and being saved by these amazing midwives. So let's briefly fill in some blanks of the history of this call story of Moses in context. You may not remember that the Israelites are in Egypt because they sold themselves into Egyptian slavery in exchange for grain during a famine. Genesis chapter 47, if you're intrigued in that whole story. And then at the beginning of the book of Exodus, as Pastor Heather reminded us last week, the Israelite hero of that time dies, Joseph. And it says, a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And the new pharaoh fears the fruitful and prolific Israelites will overtake the Egyptians. And so he encourages his people to deal harshly with the Israelites. Ruthless Egyptian taskmasters oppress the Israelites and ultimately the new pharaoh initiates a genocidal program focused on killing the Israelite boys at their birth. And as Pastor Heather reminded us of last week, courageous midwives, in particular Shifra and Pua, engage in a nonviolent resistance and save many Israelite boys, including one little boy named Moses. Moses, as we all know from our children's Bible stories, is put in the basket in the river, and he's raised in Pharaoh's household. And as Moses grows up, 
somehow, we don't know the details of this, but somehow he becomes aware of the fact that he is not ethnically Egyptian. And in adulthood, he witnesses an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, who some, again, somewhere in the story, he becomes aware that this Hebrew being beaten in slavery is his people. And in witnessing this act of violence, he kills this man. He flees Egypt, goes into the desert out of fear for his life, fear of being found out. And while at a desert well one day, he defends seven sisters from some bullying shepherds, and long story short, ends up marrying one of them named Zipporah, and he himself becomes a shepherd. And then one day, we pick up our story today, while he's tending his sheep, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I'm going to go over and see what this strange sight is. And when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses Moses. These details, I think, are important. Moses sees the bush that was on fire and did not burn up. He thinks within himself, I'll go over and see. He goes over to see, and God speaks. Moses saw, Moses thought, Moses acted. God sees this whole occurrence and God speaks. I read this week in some Jewish rabbinic traditions, they say that the bush that Moses saw has been on fire since the beginning of time. And Moses was the first person, perhaps the only person, to see it, to turn aside and look. According to this tradition, Moses was simply an everyday, ordinary person and the first person who was awake, attentive enough to see the shadows, to see the ant crawling on the floor, to see the spider over in the corner. The first person alert enough to childlike wonder enough to go over and look at it. In fact, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel said, what the rest of us lack that Moses possessed is not a will to believe, but a will to wonder. Noticing, moving slowly, having a sense of curiosity, being able to appreciate the miraculous in everyday life is the secret to discovering and encountering the presence of God. Moses is a contemplative. Now that may not shock you coming from the director of spiritual life ministries to make such a statement. I have my contemplative lenses and biases towards everyone I read in scripture. But author James Finley says, to be a contemplative means simply to observe carefully, to pay close attention. Finley continues, most of the things that we notice, we notice in passing on our way to something else. Then, every so often, something gives us reason to pause. Something catches our eye or draws our attention, and we're drawn from a moment to ponder or to reflect on that which awakened us in this way. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? You've had moments like that? This is what happened to Moses. And many of us, myself included, are too busy, too hurried to rush to get on to the next meeting, to return that email, to do the next thing, to notice, to be awake, to see and recognize the burning bushes everywhere in our lives. Perhaps you've heard this brief stanza from Elizabeth Barrett Browning's poem where she says, 
earth's crammed with heaven, and every common bush a fire with God, but only he who sees takes off his shoes. The rest sit around it and pluck blackberries. Has this happened to you? Can you recall a moment in your life where a seemingly ordinary moment or an object is transfigured into you? Infants face the observing of an act of kindness by a stranger, a silent moment between friends, or the smell of coffee on your porch before the world has begun to stir, gazing at a particular animal or bird or insect and just noticing its beauty. And then in that ordinary moment, we realize, as James Finley so eloquently says, we are in the cosmic dance of God. That the present moment, just the way it is, is already in its deepest actuality, the fullness of union with God that we spend our lives seeking. Perhaps you think I'm crazy, Perhaps you think I had too much caffeine this morning. But in that moment, you realize that the ground has not become holy, but the ground was already holy, and it's you who've been asleep. And in that moment, for whatever reason, God and God's spirit, God and God's beauty and creativity pulls back the barriers. Friends, let's even just take a moment as this is our last Sunday in the Garth on what a glorious, beautiful day. And notice something as Pastor Heather already encouraged our children and take on our own childlike wonder to notice something unique and different in this moment. Let us choose to slow down and walk and not run, pause and wonder. Open our eyes and our hearts and know that this ground right here, that we stand upon, that our feet are on, is indeed holy. Sometimes I wonder, in this time of transition in the church, and I mean capital C church, not just East Liberty Presbyterian Church, but the life of post-Christian, post-modern, post-pandemic church, We're so quickly moving and rushing to try to fix things, to get more people in the buildings, to figure out who we are and what we're supposed to do, when really what we maybe need to do is slow down and really listen. And I have to say that I admire the PNC and the elders of this church for them slowing down to ask questions and listen to you and to God in this time and space. For it is in the moments of slowing down, in the moments of paying attention, in the ordinary moments, like Moses, he perceives, he's curious, he wonders, he notices, he's attentive, and he's awake. And what happens next? God speaks. If we are moving so fast, if we are so anxious to get to the next thing, the next chapter, the next action of our lives, perhaps we miss the communication that God wants to give to us. God's presence shifts in this narrative from one who seems kind of distant from everything that's going on as to one who communicates and connects. God's presence shifts from a seemingly distant observer to a present and active presence in the unfolding drama. It seems that Moses' actions of noticing and going aside to see are what prompts God to speak. It is in that interplay and that openness in Moses to wonder and receive that he hears God's communication and connection and God says, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering, so I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land. Amen? God reveals God's self in this moment as a God who indeed sees. 
God who sees Moses going aside and the suffering of God's people. The Hebrew word here, and I have to confess to you, I learned this from a new professor who I did not have at PTS, the professor of Old Testament, is in the infinite absolute. And if I'm being totally honest with you, I don't even know what that means. But what this verb tense means in the Hebrew, it expresses the verb to see with intensity, emphasis, or certainty of verbal action. So the NRSV that we read today rightly translated it. It says, I have indeed seen. Or as another translation says, I have clearly seen. I didn't just see, but I definitely saw. In other words, God is not caught off guard, shocked or astonished or startled by the conditions of the Israelites who are living under the oppression of the Egyptians. God has decidedly been paying attention and present to the suffering of God's people. And moreover, when God sees, God acts. I have come down to rescue them. Friends, be reminded this morning that when you gaze out upon the world, when you gaze upon your own circumstances, perhaps when you gaze upon our collective circumstance, God sees you and the collective us. As Pastor Heather reminded us last week, that indeed God sees the violence and injustice and oppression and despair, and as Lenore, Lenore mentioned this morning, the changing realities of our time, the suffering of God's people, and God is a God who acts and is constantly and continually inviting God's people to see with God and participate in God's restorative justice in this world. Amen? You don't have to say amen, but it's, all, it's good if you say it. And guess what? This is where it gets interesting. Because that's who God is, right? God says, I have indeed seen. I have heard them crying out. I am concerned about their suffering. And I have come down to rescue them. And then he says this. God says this. So now I'm sending you. Can you hear Moses' internal dialogue at this point? What? What? I was just minding my own business, tending my father-in-law's sheep, and if I had just passed by this strange sight, I would not be standing here with my shoes off, covering my face because I'm afraid to look at you. And wait a minute, God, it's you who said you saw the misery of your people. You heard them crying, you're connected with them, their suffering, and you came down to rescue them. What does that have to do with me? And this begins this beautiful dialogue, this playful exchange between God and Moses. Moses asks, who am I that you would send me, that I should go? Moses struggles to embrace his own identity and as intentionally filling in that backstory this morning, perhaps wondering what this means for him. He's got a history with the Egyptians. He's a wanted man with the Egyptians. He has to phase up to his own anger and mistake that he made with the Egyptians. And yet these are his people. He struggles to believe that God's vision, God's compassion, and God's justice will come in and through his vision, his compassion, and his justice. Richard Rohr makes this beautiful, tender comment about this interaction. He says, God takes the initiative in this respectful relationship with Moses, inviting the fleeing murderer into an amazing intimacy and ongoing conversation, which allows mutual self-disclosure, the pattern for all love affairs. God invites Moses into relationship in order to pursue justice. God invites Moses to re-enter the land where he lived as a hidden foreigner in the safety and wealth of Pharaoh's household, the oppressor of his people. He was being invited to face the shadow side of his character and personality and leadership where he lost his temper and killed a man. And if that were not enough, then the words, he's, he's seeking to find the words and the courage to speak truth to the very power 
that wanted to kill him and obliterate his people. It's no wonder Moses says, who am I that I should go? I don't know about you, but this too is my journey. At different phases in my life, different asks that I sense God nudging and inviting me to, perhaps for you as well, coming to grips with our own sense of invitation and call. Who among us has not sensed God inviting us to do something, to say something, to give something that feels risky and dangerous and out of our comfort zone? And we ask God and ourselves, who am I that I should go? Who am I that I should do this? Who am I that I should say that? I'm not equipped. I don't have the power, the influence, the time, the skills. Don't you know what I've done in the past? Don't you know how bad I've been? And what is God's response to Moses' question? I will be with you. I will be with you. I will be with you. Friends, to have the courage to overcome our own inner doubts and to have the resilience to say yes to God's invitation in our lives, we must know that we are companions by the personal presence of the one who says, I am who I am. The work of justice is fueled with personal and intimate connection with a God that is beyond any name. And here we see this inherent connection between social action and prayer, the inner journey of our life and the outer journey of justice between action and contemplation. Moses is the great liberator of his people, inspiring and catalyzing liberation and justice movements throughout history. And you know what else is true about Moses? He's the only person in our holy book of the scriptures who says he has known God face to face, like one speaks to a friend. It's not a coincidence from my perspective that the greatest movement of justice and liberation in the person of Moses is also the person who is the only one in scripture that says he knew God face to face. Well, I can't tell you what God might be stirring in these feeble burning bush words this morning. But I can ask you a few questions. Where's your invitation this morning? What stirred in your heart, soul, mind, or body in a moment of hearing one particular word or phrase or image? Was it an invitation to to slow down or pay attention and be more awake to the bushes in your everyday ordinary life of fire with God? Was it an inner nudge to pursue justice for others, to speak up to power in the circumstances that you're in? Was it Moses' question of personal identity and wondering who you are? Or was it finding simple comfort knowing that despite your own doubts in this life, God is with you? Where this morning did these ordinary words in this ordinary gathering of communal worship become extraordinary? Do you want to take some more time to turn aside and look and listen and be with those words later today so that you, like Moses, might be a liberator of the oppressed and might be one who can say with confidence and humility, I know God, face to face, like someone knows a friend. By God's grace and by God's mercy, kindness and goodness, may it be so. Amen.